Good evening and welcome to the 2023-2024 Wiegand Memorial Foundation Lecture at the University of Toronto. It's a pleasure to see so many people out this, on this lovely evening. My name is Alison Keith, and I'm the director of the Jackman Humanities Institute at the University of Toronto, which is pleased and proud to host the lecture. It's my honor and privilege this evening to introduce the proceedings. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge that we're gathered on unceded land that remains a sacred gathering place for many peoples of Turtle Island, the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nation, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. The Jackman Humanities Institute acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. I'm always delighted to host the annual Wigan Memorial Foundation Lecture, a lecture series established to honor the memory of the late Dr. William Wigand, an alumnus of Victoria College in the University of Toronto, who won international acclaim for his pioneering work in the science of rubber compounds, and then, as a second act, immersed himself in the study of theology and the classics. At U of T, Dr. Wiegand earned a BSc in chemistry and a master's in physics. Later, he added a master of arts in Greek from Columbia University and an honorary doctor, uh, doctorate of laws from the University of Toronto. As the breadth of those qualifications suggest, Dr. Wiegand was deeply interested in how scientists and philosophers and theologians approach some of the larger questions confronting humanity today, particularly the issues that arise from a dialogue between science and faith. To honor his memory, Dr. Wiegand's family set up a foundation, which then in turn established this lecture series. Past speakers include such illustrious thinkers as Northrop Fry, Margaret Atwood, Robertson Davies, Sir John Eccles, and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Dr. Wiegand had an unshakable belief in the need for open dialogue amongst science, faith, and spirituality in the modern world, a belief that we in the Faculty of Arts and Science share. It's an honor for the university to be involved in this lecture series. I was saddened to learn earlier this year of the passing of Elaine Wiegand this past December, daughter-in-law of the late Dr. William Wiegand. She passed at the age of 90. And I would like to acknowledge the members of the Wiegand family who are joining us this evening. Derek Wiegand, his son and daughters, Mike Wiegand and his family and their friends. On behalf of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, I would like to express our gratitude to Elaine Wiegand, to the Wiegand family, and to the Wiegand Memorial Foundation for the gift that has made this annual lecture possible. Let me also just mention some housekeeping details before I introduce this evening's speaker, Professor John Haynes. I would ask you please to mute your devices before the talk begins. And I just want, you, uh, just want to let you know that when Professor Haynes has finished, there will be an opportunity for audience members to ask questions, and the Q&A will be moderated by Nolan Sprangers, a doctoral student in the Faculty of Music. After the Q&A, everyone is invited to a reception in the foyer immediately outside this hall, Alumni Hall, at which there will be an opportunity to speak to Professor Haynes informally as well. And so now, without further ado, let me introduce this year's speaker, John Haynes, Professor of Music and Medieval Studies at the University of Toronto. He has published on music of the Middle Ages and its modern reception in a variety of journals, both musicological, from early music history to popular music, and non-musicological, from Romania to scriptorium. 
He's the author of nine books, including Medieval Song and Romance Languages from Cambridge in 2010, and Music and Films on the, and on the Middle Ages, Fantasy versus Authenticity from Rutledge 2013. He's a contributor, amongst others, to the Cambridge history of medieval music and to film music, an introduction in 11 takes. He's been making songs since his teens, and in 2017, he published his autobiographical memoir, Missionary Kid, How I Learned to Say Goodbye. Along with his current research into the earliest origins of music, he's also writing an illustrated children's book entitled Deotila and the Moon Lizard. This evening, as you can see, he will speak to us about music before humans. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Haynes. Thank you very much. Can you hear okay? Yeah, everyone in the back? Okay, yeah, yeah, is that okay? I'll just lean into the mic, yeah, okay. All right. Well, after that awkward beginning, I'll just kind of lean into the mic and, and speak, and if you can't hear me in the back, just raise your hand. Um, I have about, uh, I've timed this very carefully because I have a lot of, um, a lot of time to uh, time periods to cover here, so um, I'm just going to walk through these slides, and then we can talk about them afterwards if, if you want. Um, there are many people I need to thank this evening, beginning with the Wiegand family and the Wiegand Memorial Foundation for their generous invitation. My thanks also to Kim Yates, Associate Director of the Jackman Humanities Institute, for suggesting the title Music Before Humans, so this was not my idea. I also want to thank the different experts that I have interviewed in the last year and a half, from paleontologists to Assyriologists, one or two of whom you'll hear from uh, at the end. Neither can I forget to thank my teacher and spouse, Dorothy Haynes, whose love of Mother Earth, along with her ecumenical tastes in reading, have brought me to this point. My journey into our topic began, and not that long ago, by the way, with the simple question, how old is music? A related question is, what is music, or rather, how have humans defined music? To answer these questions today, we'll take five steps back in time. The first step will be a small one, only 5,000 only 5, years. By the time we get to the fifth and final step backwards, We'll be thinking not in thousands of years, but in hundreds of millions of years. Hopefully, by the end, we will have a sense of the deep history of music. With each step, we'll try to widen our limited human horizons to hear as best we can the many animals that came before us, animals who had been making music for hundreds of millions of years before we, we humans came onto the scene. First, though, one more thanks. I probably would not have thrown myself into this topic with as much commitment in the last year were it not for my dear dog, Tessa. She was the first dog I ever had, which, if you, th if you think about it, is a very human way of putting things. Tessa had me as much as I had her. Every day she taught me to listen to the sounds around me, to the birds in the trees, to the wolves in the woods at night. I live a little outside of Toronto. It was only when she died 10 months ago that I realized how much I had learned from her about listening to non-humans. Tessa made me curious to know more about the non-human beginnings of music. And so this present presentation is in honor or memory of Tessa, who died on the 1st of May, 2023. All of these slides have been pared down from the original version. <laughs> About a week and a half ago, I went through all of them and cut out 
pretty much over half of the material. So we can go, uh, during the question and answer period, we can go to uh, fuller slides uh, that will, uh, if you want to have a question on, on a particular point. Uh, we're going to spend as little time as possible with humans, but we have to begin with humans, so here we go. Let's take our first step back in time to 5,000 years ago when writing first emerged. The idea that all cultures make music, quote unquote, and use the same basic ingredients of rhythm and melody is a peculiar European idea dating back to the last 200 years. That's the tiny instant at the end of the timeline in blue. In fact, most cultures in human history have, have had no equivalent for this idea of music as a universal human phenomenon. To give just one example, at the far left of the timeline, you have in cuneiform script, one of the closest words used by ancient Mesopotamians. This is the word gala, which referred to a priest singer, uh, which is illustrated in the statue just below it. Or, or that priest singer song, so it could denote both things. The ancient Mesopotamians did not have a word for music because they didn't need one. Concepts like gala were more important to them. Past the halfway point on the timeline is when the ancestors of the music concept emerged in Greece. For ancient Greeks, however, musike referred to sound as number, more or less, simplifying things. Over the next 2,000 years, other cultures appropriated the Greek musike concept and kept redefining it. Again, I'm abbreviating quite a bit of material and we can get back to this point uh, later on if you want. Only in the tiny instant, so in the last 200 years roughly, has the idea emerged of music as a kind of universal human language in connection with uh, European capitalism and colonialism and taking over the entire uh, world. Um, even today, though, music does not mean one thing to all people. For some of us in academia, it's an acoustic phenomenon. For others, music is a cultural or social phenomenon, whatever you want to call it. The most popular or common meaning of music, actually, is something that is purchased and sold, like an LP or a Taylor Swift concert ticket. We are now ready to take our second step back to 50,000 years ago. This is the archaeological record for human music making. The archaeological record for music, or human music rather, begins with instruments mo made mostly of animal bone, like the bear femur shown at the far left. Uh, the holes in this uh, bone were punctured for changing the pitch as the player uh, blew into it. Uh, this particular flute, which is presumably the oldest one, is known as the Divje Babi flute, but many others like it survive all throughout uh, this uh, 50,000 a year period. In fact, the, the, the authenticity of the, uh, of the Divje Babi flute has been questioned, but again, we can talk about that afterwards if you want. Uh, the human connection with animal sound making is also clear in art, as shown in the famous example on the far right. This is the bison man from the Trois Frères cave in France, showing a human dressed up as a bison and playing either a bow or a nose flute, or neither, it's been debated, but possibly playing a musical instrument. Only at the very end of this 50,000 year period, so during the tiny instant, barely visible on the screen, did humans do away with the animal connection. Nevertheless, it was preserved by indigenous peoples. A good example of this comes from the bird woman figures shown in the middle of the screen from the Thule people, the ancestors of the Inuit. We see a human coming out of a non-human. This is a very beautiful shorthand for evolution, if you want to look at it that way. In recent years, the view of humans as connected to the broader animal world has been getting more attention. Ecologist Paul Shepard, who's probably most famous today for uh, the concept of eco-anxiety, but he wrote about other things as well. Paul Shepard wrote um, in the 1990s, just before he died, that the ancient Greeks got it wrong when they claimed that Orpheus invented music and then taught it to the animals. It was non-humans, Shepherds writes, who gave us humans the gift 
of music. I should point out that uh, the Canadian, just for some CanCon, Canadian composer R. Murray Schaefer pointed out much the same thing, uh, maybe not as elaborately about 20 years before. We'll get back to uh, R. Murray Schaefer. The topic of human music that we've just briefly covered uh, raises the first of four biases I will uh, cover tonight. Prejudices that prevent us from thinking clearly about the deep history of music. When you and I think, for example, of the music of indigenous peoples of the Americas, like the Carolinian, Carolinian Sakotans, uh, encountered by the English in the 1500s and illustrated in this painting by John White on the left, there's an unconscious bias at work, whether we, we think so or not. We tend to think of this indigenous music as being simpler or being more primitive than, say, the symphonies of just, for, as an example, uh, not quite a random example, uh, of Austrian composer uh, Gustav Mahler pictured uh, on the right. This is what I'll call the primitive prejudice. Put that in quotation marks if you want, primitive prejudice. By primitive prejudice, I mean that so-called, and I'm quoting here, I'm quoting an ethnomusicologist named Bruno, Bruno Nettel, uh, simple cultures with no system of, of reading and writing of their own. Now, mind you, he was writing in the 50s, but still. Um, so these simple cultures evolved into so-called higher musical cultures. And yet, why should Sakotan songs, or Paleolithic flute melodies for that matter, be any less sophisticated than the prestigious, say, Adagietto from Mahler's Fifth Symphony? We may not use the word primitive anymore, may not be politically correct, but that prejudice persists uh, today subconsciously. Another example uh, of this same prejudice is the recent distinction in biomusicology between human music and non-human musicality, music versus musicality. The, implica the implication here, or the, uh, the idea here, is that musicality, uh, i.e. non-human musicality, is a primitive version or primitive form of uh, human music. Uh, that non-human music making, in other words, is more primitive or more basic than human music. As we will now start thinking about non-humans, it is good to be aware of long-standing biases like the primitive prejudice. Okay. If non-humans were here long before us, for how long had they been, been making music, however we define it? The 65 million year Cenozoic era puts in its proper perspective the human archeological record. That's in white at the very far right end of the timeline. And human writing, which is even smaller, the black dash at the far right. Early humans, like the Australopithecine Lucy, shown at the bottom right, uh, date from the very end of the Cenozoic, so roughly three million years ago, give or take. For most of the 65 million year Cenozoic, humans did not exist. Many other animals did, and they made sounds of all kinds. Not only mammals, but also insects and birds, just to mention these animal classes. The order of parrots, for example, goes back, and the parrot is illustrated on the uh, left, yeah, goes back to the early Paleocene epoch, so uh, a, uh, an era is divided up into smaller chunks called epochs. Uh, shown on the screen uh, here on the, on the uh, left is a rose-ringed parakeet species of parrot. Thinking about such long, a long stretch of time, 65 million years, forces us to consider long-term trends in animal sound production. One of these trends is the influence of one, uh, one I was going to say species, one, one type of animal on another. In this case, uh, influence of birds on primates during the court, over the course of the Cenozoic. Birds make music. Most people agree about that. I won't, I won't unwrap that, that problem, but most, most of us just accept the fact that birds make music. That's okay. It's kind of a weird thing if you think about it. Uh, we'll think about bird music a little later on. Most birds lived in trees, and these tree-dwelling birds were around from the very beginning of the Cenozoic, like the uh, parrot illustrated here. So were primates. 
beginning with Pleisiadepis from about 55 million years ago, one of the earliest primates, shown uh, just, below the, um, uh, just below the parrot on the screen. For well over 50 million years then, we primates lived in trees and listened to birds. For 50 million years, we took singing lessons from master singers. Only late in the game did Australopithecines like Lucy go to part-time ground dwelling and the rest is human history, a very short history, as you can see on the timeline. So in case you hadn't noticed, as we expand the time, the original uh, time periods we were looking at, which we hold so precious, the tiny instant of the last 200 and whatever years uh, just shrinks and it will, will eventually disappear. But not yet, we're still on the Cenozoic. Let's think about another long-term trend of the Cenozoic that relates to music, gigantism. We mammals started out as small rodent-sized creatures like Oregolestes, shown on the left, who came along just before the Cenozoic started. Over the course of the Cenozoic, mammals went from rodent-sized to, uh, to giants, like the family of Indricotheres, shown in the middle of the screen. And Dricotheres were the largest mammals to ever walk the Earth. Gigantism continued underwater in the late Cenozoic with whales on the far right. The largest mammal that ever lived, indeed the largest animal that ever lived, period, is the blue whale, which is still around in our own Holocene epoch shown on the right. This trend of gigantism is directly related to sound production. As mammals got bigger, their vocalizations became louder uh, and lower in pitch, going from ultrasound, really high sounds, to infrasound, really low sounds, both of which, neither of which we can, you and I, as mammals, can hear. For the deep history of music, or the long history of music, this long-term uh, Cenozoic trend is a major development. Ultrasound, so sounds above 20,000 hertz, gave way to sounds below uh, 20 hertz. Early mammals like Oregolestes, essentially an oversized mouse, uh, would have vocalized in a way similar to present day mice. In recent decades, biologists have shown that present day mice have sophisticated vocalizations with set motifs and distinctive musical phrases. Of course, these are impossible, impossible for us, uh, impossibly high for us humans to hear. It's only thanks to specialized microphones and amplification in the last few decades that biologists have made major advances in our understanding of the complexity of what we can now safely call mouse song. Um, and as, as I'm going to be referring to different animals, a really good book as a way into this topic, if you're you know, not a biologist specializing in, say, mice vocalizations, um, is Ed Young's uh, recent uh, bestseller, uh, An Immense World, which covers most of the main topics uh, to think about, including sound. Now, virtually all mammals, beginning with the Cretaceous period Orgolestes, there she is again on the left, blown up, um, had a feature that is indispensable to most music. I'm talking about our ear. So I'll differentiate as we go along between sound production and sound reception. But of course, sound reception is just as important to music as sound production. The mammalian ear evolved specifically for airborne sounds, although we'll think about other types of sounds later on. For now, let's get a sense of the bas basic makeup of the mammalian airborne sound ear. Our own human ear has the standard three parts as illustrated on the screen, the drawing that I made all by myself. Um, not that great, but there you go. Uh, at the far left is the outer ear made up of the horn-shaped pinna, followed by the tube-like auditory canal. This outer ear carries sounds to the middle ear, which is made up of three ossicles and they're drawn uh, or shown in gray in my image. From left to right, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup or stapes, which we'll return to later on. So remember that little bone there. These three tiny bones transmit sound waves to the inner ear on the right, specifically the, the curlicued uh, cochlea, Remember the cochlea also, we're gonna get back to that a little later on. The evolution of the mammalian ear is usually lauded by humans as a supreme achievement in animal history. And it's true, this evolutionary trait has enabled us humans to refine our hearing and grow some pretty big brains. 
but it has also limited our hearing powers, cutting out a whole swath of low-end and high-end sounds. As Henry Gee has put it in his delightful book, A Very Short History of Life on Earth, or something like that, uh, humans are cloth-eared compared with many other mammals. In other words, we humans are missing out on a whole lot of music or sound produced by other animals. And again, I'd refer you to Ed Young's uh, book, which really gives you a good sense, good quick sense of, of that. A fascinating episode in the evolution of the mammalian ear during the Cenozoic is that of the whale, uh, which evolved from land creatures like Pachycetus on the left to present day humpback whales on the right. It's interesting to me that in the last few days, uh, an, uh, an, um, an item came up uh, in our recent discovery of concerning the whale uh, vocal box, uh, vocal production. Uh, thanks to the miracle of hydrophones, underwater mic microphones, we now know that whales make music that is simply beyond our, not only beyond our hearing, but beyond our understanding. To cite zoomusicologist Dario Martinelli, the humpback whale uh, is arguably the most musically inventive animal species, uh, and that would include more musically inventive than us. The whale presents, presents us with a long-term trend that Charles Darwin in the late 1800s first identified as reversion. Originally aquatic creatures like the rest of us, whales slowly reverted back to water during the Cenozoic. At first, they were carnivorous hoofed mammals like Pachycetus on the left. These hoofed mammals uh, evolved into water-dwelling amphibians like Basilosaurus in the middle, and eventually to the late Cenozoic whales like the humpback. During this evolution from land to water, the mammalian ear of whales, uh, so originally land creatures, adapted to the new water milieu. The outer, eel, uh, the outer ear sorry, of whales disappeared putting the middle ear right up to the skull. To compensate, the, bo the bony shell, which protects the middle and inner ear, called the bulla, became bigger and harder to protect the ear. And yet amazingly, the three-part structure of the original mammalian ear stayed exactly the same in whales, enabling individuals to hear the extraordinary song cycles produced by their fellow whales. And how, how far back whale song uh, dates is not known. In a, a presentation where I'm covering so much time, we don't have time, we could spend the entire presentation on, on whale song because it's, it's such a, an incredible topic, but moving on. Obviously, there's much more to say about the music of the Cenozoic, but we don't have time for it today. From mouse and whale music to that of insects, birds, and other creatures, the Cenozoic soundscape to use R. Murray Schaefer's term, which he more or less invented, was extraordinarily rich, richer than you and I can imagine. This was non-human music, the large circle on the screen framed in red. Human music, shown in the small circle, with incidentally a few other <laughs> terms uh, for, for music that are music-related terms that I haven't covered uh, earlier, uh, was a late offshoot of this much older non-human music. The different human ideas related to music uh, shown inside the small circle are then a very late human development. Before humans came along at the tail end of the Cenozoic, the great animal orchestra, as Bernie Krause first called it in 2012, had already been performing for tens of millions of years. Influenced by R. Murray Schaefer's notion of soundscape, Krause came up with the neologism biophony, to designate the total soundscape of a given habitat or biotome. In a given biophony, each animal produces sound in a kind of give and take. Some singing high, others low, each animal um, taking uh, turns and playing its sonic role in that particular habitat. And Krause has spent quite a bit of time uh, recording different habitats uh, in kind of a depressing way uh, before humans came along and, and, and made me see, uh, you know, uh, cut down a bunch of trees and to hear the difference. And it's, it makes for a little bit of depressing reading, uh, but it's interesting. Um, in the Cenozoic, there were hundreds of millions of habitats across Earth and hundreds of millions of biophonies. These pre-human biophonies of the Cenozoic were the immediate ancestors of human music. As R. Murray Schaefer uh, put it nearly a half century ago in a rather prescient book called Tuning the World, Tuning of the World, all that humans were doing 
were, was to echo this first soundscape. The question of music in the Cenozoic raises a second major obstacle to our being able to think clearly about the deep history of music, the language prejudice. And if anybody's you know, prejudiced towards, towards language, it would be a you know, uh, published academic like myself. Language is our bread and butter, you know, so. Um, the idea that human language evolved from primitive animal music is in fact very recent, dating back to the tiny instant, actually dating back to the late 1700s and people like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau who first uh, promulgated this idea. True, language and its helpmate writing have enabled us humans to make some pretty spectacular things. Thermonuclear bombs, for example. But lately, the presumed superior superiority of human language has been called into question. A good introduction to this topic is the recent book by Canadian philosopher uh, Kristen Andrews uh, of York University on animal minds. We now know that not only animals, but also plants can remember, self-reflect, and communicate in sophisticated ways. The fact is, except for us humans, no other animal needs to distinguish between language and music, language versus music, or even obsess about the difference. There's only one way of communicating, sound waves that flow through air, water, or ground. Can we adapt the music concept to these recent findings? As I suggested earlier, the music concept is young, and it's also uh, constantly been, being redefined. So it's OK to give one more definition. In fact, biologists have been doing this quite a bit for the last 20 years or so. A number of researchers in recent years have expanded the definition of music so as to include non-humans. Those will be mostly biologists and not musicologists, by the way. The following uh, definition, which you have on the screen, combines uh, one by archaeologist Ian Morley. It's a very good book, by the way, by Ian Morley on uh, prehistory of music uh, and a team of psychologists. Um, and here it is. Music is sound communication using pitch and rhythm creatively. Of course, one of the problems from our human point of view is that a definition like this sounds a little bit too much like language, but okay. You can, you, you can unravel that in the question and answer period at the end for me. Okay, the question of music in the Cenozoic, oh, oh, all right, so yes, all right. We are now ready for a fourth and penultimate step back in time, the Mesozoic era dating back to 252 million years ago. As you can see on my timeline, the Mesozoic in green is almost three times longer than the Cenozoic era in brown on the right. Viewed from the perspective of Mesozoic time, the human Paleolithic period is reduced to a white dash on the far right and 5,000 years of human writing to an insignificant black spot. Our own precious, tiny instant of the last 200 years has vanished, it's gone. The immense Mesozoic hosted the kind of biophonic variety that is unimaginable to us short-lived humans. Aside from insects, which I haven't even talked about, but leave the insects alone, that's a whole major topic, and early mammals, the Mesozoic hosted hundreds of genera of reptiles. They ranged from quadrupeds, like Prorotodactylus on the far left, to bipeds like Forest Racket on the far right. And by the way, Forest Racket was featured on the advertisement for this event, in case you missed that. From herbivores like Diplodocus in the middle to carnivores like Forest Racket. Forest Racket was a terror bird. The overall trend in reptilian evolution of the Mesozoic begins with gigantism as we move from cat-sized critters like Prorotodactylus to building-sized sauropods like Diplodocus. The trend then reverses and miniaturization becomes the norm as reptiles shrink and diversify into the class of avians still thriving today. These trends, although they're kind of general, have major implications for the deep history of music. I realize that some of you will be disappointed at my not playing any sound clips today. The main reason, aside from time, for not doing so for Mesozoic reptiles is a major prejudice that can be summed, this is our third prejudice, can be summed up in one word, 
dinosaur. It was in the 1800s, so during the tiny instant, that Mesozoic reptiles were assigned a neologism in Greek, the favorite language of the clergyman who founded the discipline of paleontology. Dinosaurs Greek for Danosaura, on the top left, meaning horrible or terrible, whatever your translation of uh, Danos is, lizard, horrible lizard. The idea of a terrible lizard stuck. Beginning with the first exhibitions in London during the 1850s, the image in the middle shows the shop where the Crystal Palace replica, famous Crystal Palace a display of dinosaurs in the 1850s, 53 I believe, um, hosted by Queen Victoria herself. It was a major cultural event. Uh, were made. In the 20th century, the horrible lizard prejudice led to filmed entertainments like the 1933 King Kong, shown on the right, or the 1993 Jurassic Park in the background uh, image. Uh, there's a whole uh, sort of subfield, if you will, of dinosaur films which should be taken seriously, uh, and there's a great bibliography which I can recommend for you at the end <laughs> during the Q&A. The horrible lizard prejudice has resulted in soundtracks with plenty of high-tech screeches and roars. Still today, the horrible lizard remains what it was at, it, at its conception in the 1800s, the manifestation of human anxieties about the nightmare of industrialization. I promise not to play any clips, but I will, su will suggest the following one available on YouTube, uh, cited, in the, cited at the bottom left. In this clip, Sarah Tidwell uh, slows down the recording of her pet starling uh, and asks, is this what dinosaurs sounded like? And I'm, and I'm not going to play the clip for you. I think it's best, actually, to have this stuff in our oral imagination rather than you know, resort to uh, the internet. To the question, what did dinosaurs sound like, there are uh, as many answers as there were species of dinosaurs, which is to say, hundreds. An early insight came uh, in the early 20th century when it was first suggested that the horns of hadrosaurs, like Parasaurolophus on the top left, may have acted as sound resonators. Uh, this theory was debunked for the better part of the 20th century and then returned to at the very end of the 20th century. The theory has been confirmed uh, thanks to CT scanning. Related computer technologies since the 1990s have, has, have also confirmed that a number of dinosaurs had the extraordinary lung sac system of their modern day descendants, the birds. This would have given giants like Diplodocus in the large background image extraordinary singing power. The pitch range of these vocalizations is one of the great enigmas in the music of the Mesozoic. A third and most recent advance also connects dinosaur physiognomy to that of their avian descendants. This is the middle left circled in yellow. Most bird species have not one but two sets of windpipes, each activated by a complex network of muscles. This is the syrinx, and it's the reason why birds like starlings are able to outsing any human. The fossil evidence for the avian syrinx goes back to the Cenozoic birds like forest racket, in fact, featured in the poster for this event. Uh, recent studies have suggested that the reptile syrinx goes back even further some 200 million years back to the oldest clad of, of archosaurs. So it turns out Sarah Tidwell may have a point. One as yet poorly understood aspect of dinosaur sound communication is transmission of sounds via solids rather than air. The idea of singing through solids may seem ridiculous to us humans, but in fact, it's ubiquitous in today's animal world. And again, I would refer you to, uh, as, as kind of a way into this topic, to Ed Young's uh, immense world. Non-humans from frogs and moles to elephants and spiders use sound waves that actually move through solids like bone or skin or ground. More than likely, sound communication through solids was even more common in the Mesozoic. The main type is called bone, as we know about, is called bone conduction or BC. Uh, because of its usefulness to MRIs and hearing aids that matter to us aging baby boomers, research on sound transmission through bone has advanced considerably in recent years. And we now know that a great variety of sounds can be conducted through bone straight to the inner ear. A related type of communication comes courtesy of the dinosaurs' direct ancestors, the crocodiles. This would be the descendants of the archosaurs, the oldest clad of dinosaurs. Like elephants, crocodiles have tiny bumps on their skin called dome pressure receptors, or DPRs, sensory organs that detect vibrations in water and possibly on land. 
One researcher, uh, says Daphne Soares, has recently suggested that crocodilian DPRs uh, go back to uh, the reptiles of the early Jurassic period. The topic of Mesozoic sound transmission through solids brings us to our fourth and final prejudice as humans. Like language, it's a big one. Because our mammalian ears are tailor-made for airborne sound, we consider the only musically acceptable sounds to be those transmitted in the air. Paleontologist Phil Center, for example, for example, views music as having begun with the aerial sounds of the Cenozoic, a view that's reprised in an otherwise excellent book by David Haskell called Sounds Wild and Broken. Another good, uh, good one to read for this topic. The physics of sound, however, tells us a very different story. And here I'm indebted to my UFT, UFT colleague, Jason Harlow. The, in fact, the image on the, the uh, right is taken from his forthcoming textbook. All sound is a wave-like thing that moves particles in a given medium. A sound wave has amplitude and frequency, as I've tried to illustrate in the A and F in my drawing of a sound wave here. Sound waves are actually at their slowest in air, and at their fastest in solids, where particles are closer together, as you can see in Jason's diagram. That is why, for example, elephant rumbles are such effective songs, because they are traveling through the ground rather than the air. And it's, it's worth mentioning that elephant rumbles were actually only heard for the first time in the 1980s. That was not that long ago when, when researchers realized that these rumbles that they were feeling were actually sounds and then had to uh, record them and, and, and speed them up to be able to bring them up to pitch and to hear uh, these rumbles. Whole world, uh, an immense world, to quote Ed Young. Uh, so these rumbles move uh, 20 times faster than airborne sound waves. In water, sound waves move 10 times faster than airborne sound. They also travel much farther. The songs of whales, for example, can travel thousands of miles. The topic of waterborne sound brings us to our last and longest time period, the Paleozoic era, and I will add probably the most neglected one certainly after the Mesozoic. For lack of time, I'm going to focus on sound reception rather than sound production, although we could talk about uh, the sound production of, of fishes, for example, modern day fishes. During their 275 million year run as the dominant animal class of the oceans, <laughs> trilobites, on top left dark uh, blue row, diversified in over 230 families and some 15,000 species. I'll let that one sink in for a second. For communication underwater, trilobites relied on tiny sensory hairs uh, that covered their bodies as shown in the Devonian uh, specimen here on the screen, top uh, left. Um, detecting waves in water via sensory hairs led to a major development in the Paleozoic, the inner ear of fishes. Two types of fishes evolved in the Paleozoic. First came the jawless fishes, which survive today as lampreys and hagfishes. That's the second blue row on the screen. An early jawless fish, fish is Haquichthys, the little gray guy on the left. The second major fish type in the Paleozoic were jaw, jawed fishes. This is the third row, the bottom one in light blue. Miscanthus, this is the bottom left drawing, was an early jawed fish. From the clad of jawed fishes evolved bony fishes, and from these bony fishes descended two, descended two major clads. They're numbered in the third row. One, the teleosts, from whom would descend all extant fishes, and two, the tetrapods, from whom descended our own human species. In other words, what happened to fishes during the Paleozoic is of great interest to us humans, or at least it should be. And one of the things that happened to bony fishes during the Paleozoic was the evolution of the inner ear. This relates to you and me, since every sound we hear, including the sound of my voice right now, is processed through in each, each and every one of you through tiny vibrating hairs in liquid, the cochlea, uh, pictured on the bottom right of the screen. Or, actually a bad drawing, but that's all I could find. It's a pink tube on the right. For each sound that we hear, the tiny hairs in our cochlea vibrate in their liquid, hairs in liquid, and transmit a sound message to our brain. Here is how it evolved in a very short sentence or so. 
Near the beginning of the Paleozoic on the far left, jawless fishes like Mescanthus, again pictured on the top left, it developed an inner ear, rather otic capsule, it was called, it is called, uh, the round spot on the fish's head. So pictured below is uh, the fish ear with the saccule uh, the, in the very bottom, the saccule is a part uh, that's for, used for hearing. The upper part is, are the, is used for, for balance, at least in our, in our version. The inner ear evolved in connection with a lateral line system of sensory hairs on the bodies of fishes like mescanthus. So the dots that I've pictured on his body, uh, or her, their body, is, uh, or, or is the lateral line going out of the otic capsule or inner ear. In a separate but related development, jawed fishes also developed various jaw bones. One of these jaw bones was a bracing strut that turned into a sound conductor for early creatures like Simoria. That's the lizard looking guy in the middle. An early tetrapod, Simoria had all the ingredients of the reptilian ear later found in dinosaurs. From left to right in the middle drawing that you have below of a reptilian ear, uh, a flat eardrum so there's no outer ear, a sound conducting bone, it's actually several sound conducting bones, the longest one there is in fact the stirrup, the stampes. And finally, an inner ear with a slightly curled cochlea, not quite as curly as you, yours and mine, but getting there. That early tetrapod cochlea became the curly cochlea of mammals. And that's the broken arrow uh, on the right. Or not, it's not broken, actually. It's the um, brown arrow <laughs> on the right. And the stirrup shrank to become one of our middle ear bones. That's the blue arrow. This whole transition from aquatic to airborne sound ear is the central episode in the deep history of music. Next to it, Beethoven's symphonies are insignificant playtime scribbles. Sound received by tiny sensory hairs floating in water. This has been the most consistent mode of communication in all of animal life. From our current Cenozoic era all the way back to the Paleozoic 542 million years ago, animals have communicated thanks to tiny hairs floating in liquid, the cochlea in our case. We mammals will never know, of course, what it was like for a Paleozoic marine animal to experience sound waves in water. As Canadian paleontologist Tatuto Mayushita recently said to me, we humans are stuck with a very anthropocentric way of thinking. One big difference between us, mammals or humans, and our Paleozoic ancestors is that they detected waves not just with their inner ears, but with their entire body. John Ryan, a specialist in oceanographic sound, related to me a story about an underwater photographer friend of his who had spotted a sperm whale. The photographer let the whale approach, and as it did, it started interrogating him with sound as if, and I'm quoting John Ryan here, as if he was asking him a question. Every cell in his body vibrated with the intensity of the sound. Underwater sound is not just an ear thing, it's an experience of the whole body receiving and emitting sound waves. If we had to redefine music for the Paleozoic, we might borrow the definition given by Siddhartha Mukherjee in his bestseller, The Song of the Cell. And so on the screen, he uses the word song, but we can just substitute music. Music is a series of messages sent out from one being to another to signal interconnectedness and cooperativity. Bukherji's Song of the Cell is a book about the earliest form of life on Earth, one that predates the Paleozoic era by hundreds of millions of years, microbial cells. These earliest life cells on Earth four billion years ago had tiny hairs called cilia and flagella. Just like the tiny hair cells of our cochlea, these hairs were the conduit for messages sent out from one being to another. They were the earliest music on Earth. Or were they? If we had time today, I would take yet one more leap back in time, back to the first orbits of our planets around the sun that the ancient Greeks and medieval Latins called the music of the spheres or the harmony of the spheres, but there isn't time when I think of our young planet four and a half billion years ago, I think of Tessa, my dearly departed dog, of Tessa when she was very young. I think of how long ago that was, not hundreds of thousands of years ago, not hundreds of millions of years ago, but 13 years ago. And I am grateful. I am grateful that you and I could spend this time together 
thinking about what music might have been before humans. And I want to thank you for being here today with me to think about this very unusual topic. Thank you, John, for such a fascinating talk. Uh, my name is Nolan Sprangers. I'm from a PhD student at the Faculty of Music and in Environmental Studies as well. Uh, and I'll be leading this final portion of our time here this evening. Uh, so you will have a chance to ask any questions to Professor Haynes. Lisa's just setting up some microphones in the middle row. So we've got one towards the back and we'll have one at the front here as well. Um, but just while we're getting set up, maybe I'll start us off with a question. So John, you mentioned that in this tiny instant that you talk about of music that we're in now, we're getting further and further away from the non-human world. Yet our sheet music is printed on plants, animals are made, or sorry, instruments are made with uh, woods from different trees, animal skin for leathers, gut strings. Um, so do you see any sort of compatibility between this much deeper history and our conception of music in this tiny instant now? Yeah. Um, thanks. That's a great question. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, needless to say, you know, uh, I think part, part of my throwing myself into this topic, aside from Tessa, <laughs> has to do with uh, all of our collective anxiety, eco-anxiety, if you want to call it that, about, you know, uh, what has happened to our connection to, to, uh, to earlier non-humans. Uh, I, I don't really don't know how to answer that question. I, I think probably all of us can kind of feel there, there's, there's something that we've, we've lost. As, you know, the question at some point, of course, as one considers the deep history of pretty much anything, uh, is when did things go wrong, right? Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the author of Sapiens. Um, 2014 book, Harari, there we go, yes, Harari. Uh, was, this is probably an early book where, you know, if you, look, if you look at the opening page of Harari's Sapiens from 2014, there's this chronology that makes immediately clear that as soon as humans show up, that's pretty much when things go, go wrong, right? So the, so the question that, you know, that, that's, that's the answer as of the 2010s. Paul Shepard famously in the 1980s was suggesting that things went wrong in the Neolithic. That was kind of his, his theory. Um, and so, you know, before that probably, people would say European capitalism, you know, the last 500 years. Um, as far as that, how that relates to our, you know, moving further and further away from that animal connection, uh, I don't know. But uh, I suppose, you know, the closer we can get back somehow, <laughs> uh, better things will be. Yeah, thank you. All right, I'd like to open it up to the rest of the audience. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to come towards uh, whichever microphone is closest. My cat of many years ago had a real appreciation of music. And what happened was my husband went on a trip to Ukraine. He brought back as a souvenir a little primitive little shepherd's flute with a few holes in it. And my daughter had a friend visit, picked it up off the table. She was a real flutist and she picked it up and played a few bars. And my cat stopped what he was doing and listened with both ears. And then she stopped playing and he said, meow, which means, uh, and I said, I think the cat wants more. So she played a bit more. She stopped and he said, meow, again. And sh she gave him a second encore. And then I guess he was sati satisfied and went back to what he was doing. And I think he really liked the music. Now, was your dog the same? <laughs> mm, I, yeah, that's a, that's a great anecdote. Uh, I, my dog did, really didn't appreciate flute music. I don't think I think probably I tried to play the recorder once or twice, and that was the end of that. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we're one of the other things that's that's happened in the last few years, sort of in the last ten years since Harari wrote his you know mind-bending *Sapiens*, is that um, is these animal videos, right? That, that so many of us, well, some of us, <laughs> watch. You know, we can now hear so many uh, the sounds of so many different animals and be exposed to that. We, every person kind of becomes their own biologist, if you will, in a way that was not possible uh, certainly 20 years ago before the internet. So. Yeah, thanks for that. Sorry. I was absolutely quiet about your mistake. Do we know if animals use sound or music purely to entertain themselves? Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I thought I had a slide. I don't have a slide on that, no. Uh, some, some of these, the other slides that I have, let me just quit here. See if I can find that. Uh, but so, so the topic of animal play is um, probably the best uh, place to go for, for thinking about that. And um, in connection with music would be Martinelli's, uh, let me pull up the slide, Martinelli's Zoomusicology from 2009. And Mar uh, Dario Martinelli was one of the first uh, musicologist, sort of trained musicologist, trained uh, semiotician to think about uh, animals seriously, to take that topic seriously. Um, and in this book he talks about play because of course animal play is, is well studied by biologists and uh, Martinelli in fact suggests that play probably in terms of, of animal evolution was one of the earliest uh, manifestations of, of kind of animal non-human musicality. Um, that, that's an early, that's a relatively early insight in terms of, uh, you know, biomusicology, zoomusicology, uh, which is probably no older than the early 1990s when the term biomusicology was coined and then uh, I think it was Martinelli, I believe, uh, in the early 2000s who, who came up with this, this word zoomusicology. No, it wasn't Martinelli, but he was the one who made it um, uh, famous. It was actually a French... Um, organist, French composer, uh, the last name is Mush, in the, in, in the 1980s, so he would be the first person to think about uh, zoomusicology. He came up with that word. But um, before that, really the idea of taking animal music as seriously, uh, non-human music as seriously as human music was really not happening, certainly within academia. Um, so, but yes, to get back to your question, play, the whole topic of animal play and non-human play is, is is really closely re closely related to the evolution question about the evolution of music. Um, yeah. I have a meandering question, uh, which unfortunately I think is only apl ap applicable to the last 500 years, um, so it's not necessarily the nature of, of your talk. However, as you mentioned, uh, when humans came along and ruined everything. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about, you know, before that and, and what perhaps has been lost. Um, and I, I, I would love to know what the human ear heard uh, 10,000 years ago versus what we hear now. And um, as we know, we can't see a lot of the light spectrum and we can't hear a lot of the sound spectrum. But to sort of take things in reverse, and to mention stupid YouTube, there's a parrot, which you had in slide one or two, I think. Yeah. Uh, there's a guy who plays guitar, and his parrot sings along in tune. So our stupid, you know, eight tone, 12 tone, whatever mm -hmm. scale has now been imposed <laughs> on this bird yeah, yeah. that probably has a range, you know, that's incredible. Yeah. And then the other thing that occurs to me really meandering, is that because I grew up here, I don't hear quarter tones very well. And I've tried, and eventually in Arab, Arabic music or what have you, wherever, from at least a third of the planet, if not more, and they can hear that. So there's a cultural thing factored in as well. And I'm wondering if there's any information on increments, I'm sure much smaller than a quarter tone, that would be perceivable yeah. by things more advanced than us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's my mess of a question. <laughs> yeah. 
No, that's uh, that's. I think there's no answer answer for it. I, I think the, but your your point. One of your points was that um, animals have changed, you know, with us. I mean, if you ha all you have to do is think about uh, the telegraph wires. I think there's a sentence in Darwin's Descent of Man where he mentions he's writing in the 1870s and he mentions uh, the telegraph wires and that birds, uh, so many birds have perished. By, by you know hitting these wires, which they were not used to, to, to seeing before, say 1850, right? Um, and that eventually, over time, seeing the body, as I'm forgetting the exact phrasing, but eventually, over time, seeing the bodies of their fallen comrades, as he puts it, they they finally realized, okay, we we need to adapt to these. You know, the question of how much animals, say, in the last 200 years, have adapted to to us, like you, you're talking about these these videos is a really good one. And that's the kind of work that, you know, still uh, w waits to be done, you know? I mean, there, there, there are so many uh, possible topics in terms of uh, uh, PhD theses, you probably already have yours, but, um, you know, that, that, uh, that are kind of begging to be, to be done. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hello. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank you for your amazing presentation, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that music uh, is a form of communication. Um, so I was wondering if there's any evidence in the history of non-humans of creating music, kind of recreationally, different kind of melodies as we know it, as opposed to just solely for a communication purpose. Mm -hmm. Hmm, yeah. So, so basically where the research is, the bulk, of, I should say, the bulk of the research, <laughs> which is why I was interested in more in paleontology, bulk of the research now, and that's getting, you know, the, the, the press and the news and all that, is um, with present day uh, animals, right? People, people like um, Tecumseh Fitch or other biologists who are like this, this whale uh, story that came out in the last few days, right? Uh, dealing with um, present-day animals, and uh, the, the theory, the theories are, are really working mostly, if not exclusively, with communication, right? But, but yeah, you're, you're again raising the question of play <laughs> that, mm. that Dario Martinelli raises in his, his zoomusicology book. I think that's, that's, a, that's, an, that's a big question, like that's an important question to ask. You know, were animals you know, in previous times, uh, whenever, uh, playing with sound without any particular goal in mind. Mm -hmm. Pop probably, <laughs> you know, whether we can imagine, you know, say, a dinosaur <laughs> playing with sound without the, 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 the need for communication being there, that's an interesting question, I think. Do you think that human um, kind of, human influence has influenced animals or non-humans today? in that kind of music perception? Of course, of course. Production. I mean, you know, it's hard for us now to find, you know, a spot on earth where it, which has not been, you know, uh, polluted by humans, uh, to find animals that are living without having been exposed to human beings. Now this is practically impossible. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, I, th I think that's. Sorry, one last question. Yeah, how, sure. And how do you think that will then affect the future of non-human kind of communication? Well, yeah. So, so now you're 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 coming to the whole topic of, of of anxiety, right? I mean, I have to say that part of my uh, my my thirst for for knowledge about this topic is driven by the you know kind of our the the, the, the eco anxiety that is in our collective uh, unconscious, whether we admit it or not. You know, I I, I want to know the answers to these questions, even, even as we can see, you know, every year, every month, uh, humans further encroaching. I would, to take just the aquatic, aquatic the seas, you know, uh, the news is bad. It's just very bad every day. <laughs> it gets worse. Uh, so, yes, one wants to kind of capture these things, such as whale songs, before, you know, ships start completely uh, obliterating the songs of these uh, amazing creatures. Well, the irony, of course, um, is that all of these discoveries have been made sort of in tandem with human encroachment. I mean, if you look at, this is one of the things I explore for the, the book project of this. Um, if you look at the develop, by, say, let's say, let's say um, the discovery of, of fish ears. That's, that's basic, that basically started in the early 20th century. Before that time, scientists were divided at best 
did, didn't think that fish, fish had ears. But as uh, you know, uh, hydrophones became possible, submarines, uh, the, so the World War II was a, ma was a watershed moment in terms of hydrophones and, and underwater uh, research. But with that came major destruction of, of, of you know, water habitats. One need think only of the, the, the thir testing of, for th thermonuclear bombs in the 1950s. That, that destroyed entire islands. And we, we all, all we see is a plume in the sky, <laughs> but stuff was happening underwater, which was not that great. Um, so yeah, I, I, to answer your question, I don't know. I, of course, you know, I, I probably would tend to be a little bit less optimistic. I hope you're more optimistic. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you for a fascinating uh, lecture. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, so my question is uh, how, if at all, this story of music and uh, sound that you've been telling sort of overlaps with uh, a story of um, dance and um, uh, bodily story of, of dancing, story? dance and bodily dance, movement. Yes. Oh. So I know that you know birds will do these very elaborate kind of dances for one another, and they've been mapped out and um, by biologists looking at their evolution, and I think that they're coordinated with with sound as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how deep does that sort of uh, connection, you know, go between coordinated bodily movement, rhythm, and um, and sound and music? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this has been explored by, oh, at least as uh, as early as Dario Martinelli. Again, I keep referring to this book. Mm -hmm. It's a good book. Zoo, it's called Zoo Musicology or something like that for 2009. We only have one copy, a copy on campus, just so you know. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but he explores that a little bit. Uh, the, the, the dances, notably, of certain birds, like cranes, most famously. Um, the question then for, for biologists or evolutionary biologists is how, how far back does this behavior go in, say, cranes? Uh, you know, a variety of cranes, for example, uh, have elaborate uh, dances and so on. Um, for the most part, uh, biomusicologists have kept two present day animals. Uh, so that's interesting, but it would be even more interesting, at least I feel, uh, to, to, to at least conjecture how far back these uh, behaviors go. Because of course, humans, uh, again, were watching or listening to, to, to the, 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 the earlier soundscape, and more than likely, I think you're right, they were listening and watching to this, this, this music and movement, this dancing. Uh, it's, it's intriguing, isn't it, to think about. Um, I, I feel like one or two other people have written about this, maybe Bernie Krause a, a little bit, but uh, Martinelli in this book that I mentioned has as well. And of course, there is recent research uh, by, by uh, biomusicologists. Um, uh, Honing is his last name here. Let me find uh, this reference on my uh, loaded slide. Um, Here somewhere. Uh, on, the, on the bottom left, I originally had uh, bibliographic references, but it's just cloud. This just crowded out the slides. So, but on the bottom left here, you have uh, just while we're talking, looking at it. Um, Kristen Andrews, How to Study Animal Minds. This is a really good introduction to the kind of biological, biological issues I was talking about. Uh, here is Paul Shepard's book, The Others. Uh, the Gift of Music is a uh, chapter in this book. This book was published uh, the year he died, I believe. Um, a really great book. And this, there's also uh, Krause's Great Animal Orchestra. But for... Um, there's Martinelli's uh, books. Actually, it's not entitled Zoo Musicology. That may be in the title. Uh, Martinelli's Of Birds, Whales, and Other Musicians. This is a great uh, introduction to the, to the topic. Um, uh, but that's not the book I'm looking for, and I'm going to get to it here in a moment. Uh, here it is. Um, Honing is the last name. The Evolving Animal Orchestra. Oddly enough, this is seven years after... Uh, Krause's book, but he doesn't give credit. He doesn't cite Krause anywhere. Uh, this book was translated from the Dutch, so maybe he, he could be forgiven. But, um, uh, but uh, this would be typical of the, uh, the, the trend of biomusicology nowadays, which is to fo focus almost exclusively on, um, on present-day animals. Uh, 
essentially the idea is, in fact, Honing states this in this book, a 2019 book, that well, you know, there, there's no record of sound in, in the fossil evidence, so never mind that, we, there's nothing to say, nothing to, to, to look at here. Um, uh, paleontologists have been saying something different <laughs> in the last 30 years at least, ha have been uncovering all kinds of uh, amazing stuff about uh, the, the sound world of, of, of ancient animals, including uh, everyone's favorite, dinosaurs. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if there aren't any other questions, I think we will wrap this portion up there. Um, so thank you again, John, for a really interesting talk. Um, <laughs> I do find it interesting. We all have these stories about a pet cat or a, a video of a bird we've seen. We see and hear these things happening around us, but there's still so much to learn about it. Um, so just a couple things to wrap up here. Thank you again to the Wiegand family f uh, for sponsoring this event and making it possible. Um, and we will be having a reception in the lobby just after. So if you'd like to continue conversation informally, please feel free to do so out there along with some food. And very last thing here, Allison Keith will be uh, presenting a gift. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.